We have the folks who can fund your company. We have the folks then can help sell your company. Uh, and uh, we're lucky to have them. So, so, so Scott Sandell over here. We, you know, Forbes does the Midas list every year, which is the ranking of the top uh, venture capitalists and investors. And, and we've been doing it since 2007. Only six people have been on every single Midas list. And Scott, uh, I think uh, number 10 right now, uh, is one of them. Uh, of course, at NEA, which where, where are you guys uh, in terms of total money? Uh, 13.7 billion. 13.7 billion. So there's a little bit, bit of money sloshing around there. Uh, and again, it's done, as they mentioned, it's done everything from Salesforce to Workday and some absolute jackpots. Then uh, George Lee, who, um, who just literally just came, uh, just, just flew in uh, at Goldman Sachs. He's the chair of the uh, Media and Telecom Group and also at the investment bank as the chief information officer. So again, you're seeding startups uh, in later stage as well and also helping to sell. So uh, we got them while they're punchy. Again, Scott just came in from Shanghai, and George literally, you want to talk about risk tolerance. This is somebody who, ch who just got off the plane an hour ago, coming to this panel, and he checked his luggage. <laughs> so that is, uh, that is somebody, who has, that, that's somebody who has faith. So uh, we're, we're glad you guys are here. Let's talk about where we are uh, with the market. First question, uh, valuations. Uh, what, what's your take? Uh, feel a little bubbly, or we like where we are? Well, I think there's a big divergence between public market valuations and private market valuations. And since Scott is the, the uh, expert on private market valuations, I'll just give you a sense. In the, in the public markets, we actually think valuations are, are relatively reasonable. And when companies come to the public markets, they're getting valued in ways that are in some ways are aspirational, but are also synchronized with the ultimate economics of the, of the business. And th while the, the markets are forward-leaning, they're really interested in buying growth from the best companies. Um, you know, I don't think we're in any way, shape, or form in a, in a, a bubble-oriented position for public valuations today. You know, I think there are some, some little pockets of exuberance, but I think fundamentally what investors realize, and I'm, I'd be curious what you see in the public markets, George, but I think investors realize that this is a once-in-generation sort of opportunity to change the landscape, that all of the incumbents are vulnerable for the first time in our lifetime. And so people are looking for companies that establish leadership and have a big market opportunity, and they're willing to pay up to get in early for the ones that, you know, if you hold them long enough, are going are gonna to make you, you know, very nice returns. Well, speaking of once in a lifetime, I mean, the traditional model is you get lower valuations in the private markets, and then you, you exit with the public markets. So it just seems that there's a the pri there's a premium now in the private markets. I mean, how do we square that? Well, I, I think it's it's basically the, the premium is, is ascribed to companies that uh, I think will probably have premium valuations when they get to the public market. So I think it's a little bit apples and oranges. Uh, but you know, George will will tell us better what's going to happen to you know all of these five ten billion dollar private market cap companies when when they go public. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, there's just been a sea change in the amount of money that's raised in the private capital markets. In fact, if you set aside Alibaba, there's more money raised in the technology private equity capital markets in the last year than in the public markets, right. which is extraordinary. And yes, some, many of them, there are 25 deals in the last 12 months that have been at greater than a billion dollar private market valuation. Right. Some of those are going to have to grow into their very large valuations before accessing the public markets. But just as Scott said, for these really big opportunities, they're disrupting very large markets. People are pretty interested in buying lottery tickets to big, big outcomes. Right, and, and you, you were uh, chief with the Twitter IPO, and that was, of course, a great example. How do you, it, there does seem to be this, I don't know how you call it, maybe a whale economy, where you're looking for, you're betting for the, the whale investments. I mean, it's not, it's not you know, home, you know home, the home run companies are the perceived home run company. I mean, it's always true, but it seems like that's accelerated. I mean, how do you, you know, Slack, for instance, with just, I mean, it's what, less than a year old, it's a billion dollar startup now. How, what's the criteria you guys are looking for when you're trying to find kind of those whale type potentials? Well, I do think that our, the venture capital ecosystem is driven by home, home run opportunities. And so uh, the good news is that there the are more of those. The difference is now the home runs are grand slams. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there's a bit of that. But I also think it's, it's what I said before. The opportunities for disruption are much better yeah. than they've been in a long time. And so if you go back in the, the last decade, there might be one every three or four years. 
you know, that would come to the public markets like Salesforce did or, you know, and now we're seeing, I don't know how many a year, a, a, a lot, and I think we're gonna see more because I think the, the infrastructure that's been laid down with the cloud and mobile is now uh, enabling the disruption of a lot of traditional businesses and education and healthcare and, you know, transportation, all sorts of things, which I think is gonna enable many more of these really large scale public opportunities. Yeah. It's, it's, I think the term once in a lifetime is kind of a misnomer. I keep saying it too, but you know, in my lifetime, we've had multiple what seemed like once in a lifetime opportunities, and it's just suggestive of what Scott said, which is the aperture is opening up, the markets are opening up, there's a lot of places for young companies to go make a lot of money, and the market cap expansion is a, is a creature of that. How, how do you guys figure out valuation when you're, you know, a company with no revenue, that's old hat. Now, you know, you have big valuations for a company with no, again, apparent revenue model. How do you figure out what a company like that's worth? Well, that's clearly science, Randall. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, I, that, you know, the, I think what really happens is the market dictates it. It's a competitive process. These really fantastic entrepreneurs and companies, you know, have lots of sources of capital and and there's usually a competitive process to determine the price and you have to decide whether you're willing to pay it if you're lucky enough to have a chance. Well, talking about the competitive marketplace, let's say we have a lot of founders here. Uh, let's say they have a choice between uh, a venture fund, with, you know, or a venture capitalist or uh, an investor with uh, maybe pushing for, you know, harsher terms, but maybe a more prestigious investor versus somebody, how, how do you weigh the quality investor versus the term sheet? That's a hard one, Randall. I think uh, you know, people, people make legitimate decisions you know, to pick investors that come from different walks of life at different points in time. I think my general guidance, which is just you know, as a friend of an entrepreneur, is the earlier it is in the cycle, the more important it is to have somebody who really understands the journey you're embarking on and can help you along the way. And you know, later in life, it's, it's not quite as important. And I would say, from my perspective, ex post, when an entrepreneur on the eve of their IPO looks back over the history of their private capital raising, um, the amount of value added from the right venture capitalist in the right place at the right time with the right mentorship and the right advice is just tremendous. So it is an important decision early on. Do you, uh, in terms of how much you raise right now, do, would, are you seeing or do you advise people to raise as much as they can whenever they can or should they keep it leaner? I don't think it, it's necessarily a good idea to raise as much as you can. Uh, I think you should always raise a little bit more than you think you need because things tend to take longer and, mm -hmm. and often cost more than you think at the outset. Uh, but too much money can, can spoil companies. So uh, I'm a little wary of that as an investor. On the other hand, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to have a, a, a well-capitalized company and, and it allows you to take you know, maybe a little bit more risk on the margin than, than you might uh, otherwise do. Yeah, it's, it's a really hard one because the markets are so good and the access to large-scale capital is so great that in the one hand you will say, just go raise as much money as you can. You don't never know what's gonna happen in the environment. At the same time, I think it's pretty clear that you know, scarcity is the enemy of ingenuity and capital, capital allocation decisions are so important for young companies and there's a certain um, benefit of that, that scarcity having to make those tough decisions that's useful in the development of companies. Well, and the opposite is if you raise too much money, it almost forces a, it forces a burn rate. Uh, and we exactly, may feel. Well, it doesn't problem. necessarily force a burn rate. And I, I, one of the things I've noticed is that the really great entrepreneurs don't spend according to what's in the bank. They spend according to what makes real sense for their business, and they're very, very careful with capital. But I think the, uh, mm. the, the thing that it does force is sort of uh, a particular exit trajectory. So if you raise a lot of money at a high price and you're trying to do what's right for your investors, then you're necessarily headed to a big outcome. And that, and that sort of forces you down a certain path you may or may not want to go down. Uh, let's talk about sourcing deals. What's your kind of, in terms of a lot of people out here trying to figure out how they can get in front of you and what do you find is the most effective way that you're finding these new companies, these breakthrough companies? Well, I think we, we have proactive efforts to, to see, you know, what's going on on the web. It's, it's thankfully an algorithmic exercise now, so we've always kind of combing for things that are, that are rising. But I think the early stuff most often comes to us through our trusted relationships. That's been true for a long time and it's still true today. 
Are you having people spend time on campuses? I, I'm increasing, I hear from venture capitalists that they're having people out on the campuses at Stanford and MIT and places like that, is it? We do. I mean, we've always, you know, spent a lot of time at Stanford and now we've sponsored the X Fund at Harvard. And right. so we've been doing that for a few years. Um, you know, different people who are alums of different universities, that is our partners, tend to go back and spend time on campus. I went to Dartmouth, so I spent time there looking around. So. Yeah. I mean, we're sitting here in Dublin. How, uh, the, you know, the traditional aphorism is that, you know, people who are seeding companies, you know, venture capitalists, who, they're looking for local companies. They want to stay close to their investments. Is that changing? I think it's, it's often the case that, you know, we, we like to invest in our own backyard, but we invest around the world. I mean, the most recent investment I closed in is in Dubai. Mm -hmm. I've never been to Dubai. <laughs> that, might, that might sound a little irresponsible, but... <laughs> what, um, now you're just back from China, and, and it's got to think you run, do you run the China, at any, you run the, the I do. Uh, China practice. Uh, what, what are you seeing over there? I mean, what's, what's exciting about China right now? You know, China, China is at a fantastic spot. I mean, I've been going there for 12 years. I haven't seen it. I've seen a few other points in time where the, uh, the amount of innovation entrepreneurship was really exciting. Uh, but, but right now, the, the playing field is, is, is super exciting. I think there's as much innovation going on there. People may not realize this, but the, the venture ecosystem has grown up in China to the point where there's almost, almost as much venture capital invested on an annual basis in China as there is here. And for the first time, there's the rise of a, an angel ecosystem as well with you know, uh, founders and, and other early employees of the bat companies, you know, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, now actively funding new, the next generation of entrepreneurs. A very exciting time. George, where, where, what regions or areas are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, on the, one, on the one hand, I would say it's one of the most encouraging things about what's going on is that great companies are getting created all over the world. And so our practice is very global, and we've been fortunate to partner with great entrepreneurs in, in Europe, in Asia, certainly in the States. Now, it's amazing how much innovation still remains in a magnified, you know, three zip code zone around Silicon Valley. And so there st still really is the epicenter of this. Like Scott, I would say if I had to choose one other big uh, point of creation of, of market cap and value, it's in China. There's amazing things going on there. Another, another un more untapped potential, uh, women. I mean, from guy to guy to guy here, how do we get more women? Uh, how do we fund more female startup, female run startups? How do we get more women venture capital and, and banking? You know, Randall, it's super important. Um, for me, I have three daughters. That's one reason I'm excited. And I have two, so that's. But you know, I think the, I think the right perspective here is that the the companies are going to be better, and we're going to have better outcomes because you know, 50 percent of the talent in the world happens to be female. So if we don't tap into that in a a more aggressive way, it's our loss, not the other way around. It's more like 50 percent of the people, 70 percent of the talent, <laughs> probably. Uh, but uh, yeah, as father of two daughters, so we've got seven seven oh, girls seven, up here. Seven daughters. Will look different than the present. I want to talk about um, the one that got away. Uh, if both of you could tell you know, tell us the one investment you wished you made that you had a chance to make, and why you didn't make the investment. Well, you're you're puzzling, George. I'll start. So <laughs> it's Netflix. Reed Hastings um, came to see me. I don't remember the year, but it was in the late '90s. Things seemed very expensive. Um, I had known. Read for a while, and, and he was nice enough to stop by and say he was going to raise a Series B. I think it was 55 pre. It seemed like about twice the price that was reasonable for Netflix at the time. But I knew Reed was going to do, you know, he's spectacular. He was going to be successful. I had no doubt about the success of the company, but I just thought the valuation was a little rich. And every time I've made that mistake of not paying up for something mm -hmm. great, I've regretted it. And that's, that's the biggest one that yeah. this audience would know about. A crazy coincidence, but I would say exactly the same thing. Uh, Reed came to us wanting us to lead their IPO, and we agonized over it and wrung our hands and then made the wrong decision to not do it, and he's gone on to prove us extraordinarily wrong. I think it, it leads to a follow-up question, which is, I mean, the classic, you know, the classic, it's not a dilemma, and ideally you want both, but the idea versus the founder. Both is ideal, but if you had to err on one side or the other, are you betting on the founder or are you betting on the idea? Well, we, most of our investments are early, you're always betting on the people. 
I mean, the, the early idea usually changes quite a bit before it becomes the right idea. And so if you don't have you know, the right people uh, leading the charge, you know, it's, it's going to be hard. I think one of the cool things, one of the sea changes in my 20 years as a banker is that when I started, the uh, conventional wisdom was that there was a necessary transition from founder to professional manager. And, uh, you know, just it's funny to say today that is much more the exception rather than the rule. And great founders have gone on to demonstrate their ability to be unbelievable leaders of huge public market companies. Uh, last question. Uh, we have a lot of people in the room, again, who are working on startups. Uh, you guys, again, have very well-honed systems to reach them. How, what, what do you find is the most effective way for them to, to reach you? Well, it's what I said before, Randall. I mean, find somebody that we already know who's in our trusted totally. network is, is always the best way to get our attention. I wish it, I wish it was easier. It's just there's a, there's a large volume to deal with. And we're a little bit of a second derivative of that in the sense of we screen a lot of our activity around who... Um, are the entrepreneurs aligned with some of the great venture capitalists that we've done business with over the years. We're increasingly also trying to put boots on the ground to go find young entrepreneurs earlier and earlier because these companies are emerging so fast, but a lot of it is, is screened for us by the venture folks that they decide to work with. Well, again, we have two titans of the tech economy. I think they're going to be hanging around. I think you guys are going to be very popular, so, uh, but thank you very much for your insight and for your time. We really thank appreciate you. it. Thanks, Randall. Great to be with you, George. You too.